In this video we will talk about the regional difference in ventilation and regional differences in blood flow. This means that different lung regions have different ventilation and different blood flow perfusion. Then we will see how they match to each other by looking at ventilation perfusion ratio. First let's talk about regional difference in ventilation but in order to understand how ventilation changes in different lung regions, we have to know regional difference in intrapleural pressure. It is very important to know that at FRC the mean value for intrapleural pressure is negative 5 cm water. However, there are regional differences and the reason for these differences is gravity. Let me explain in a nutshell the regional difference in intrapleural pressure because it is really important. Suppose a man is lying on a bed. You know that the lung surface is covered by visceral pleura and the inner surface of the thoracic cavity is covered by parietal pleura. And a pleural cavity which I have enlarged is the thin fluid filled space between these two pleura. It is very important to know that at FRC the lung tries to collapse and a chest wall tries to expand due to recoil force. As a result, it creates a negative intrapleural pressure and at FRC it equals to negative 5 cm water. In a man who is lying down, the negative 5 intrapleural pressure is in all pleural regions, in the base of the lung, middle and apex. So here is a question. How can one decrease the intrapleural pressure supposed in apical region experimentally? In order to make the intrapleural pressure even more negative, uh, I mean uh, in apical region, you will pull this region inward further trying to collapse it. Further because it is already slightly deflated due to recoil. And we get this size of lung which I'm drawing with dashed lines and pleura. Thus both pleura separate from each other in an apical region, let's suppose this amount. As a consequence the intrapleural pressure in this region becomes even more negative. Suppose it drops from negative 5 to negative 10 cm water. However, the other regions remain negative 5. This is actually what is happening in an upright person. If the person stands up, the lung will be pulled downwards due to gravity. Thus, the apical region of the lung will be stretched more and the intrapleural space increases at this region, suppose this amount. However, the intrapleural space decreases in basal region this amount. As a consequence, the intrapleural pressure in the apical region drops down to negative 10 cm water, whereas in a basal region it increases up to negative 2.5 cm water. It is very important to know that this regional difference in intrapleural pressure affects the alveolar size and the ventilation in turn. Again, in an upright standing man, the intrapleural pressure in apex is negative 10 cm water, negative 5 in the middle and negative 2.5 in the base of the lung. This brings us to the regional difference in ventilation. That discussion about intrapleural pressure was only to understand this concept. It is very important to note that the alveolar size is dependent on intrapleural pressure. What this means is, the more negative the intrapleural pressure, the larger the alveolus. The less negative the intrapleural pressure, the smaller the alveolus. The intrapleural pressure in the lung apex is negative 10 cm water in an upright person at FRC. And in a basal region it is negative 2.5 cm water. Again, the more negative the intrapleural pressure, the larger alveoli widen. Thus, the alveolus in the apex is larger than in a basal region. What does this tell us? This tells us 
that the alveolus in apex is stiff and less compliant because it is already stretched open and it is difficult to further stretch and open it. Again, the less compliant nature of this alveolus means that during inspiration it opens less, suppose this amount, and thus less air flows into the apical alveoli. The alveolus in the base of the lung has smaller size, thus it is more compliant and it is easy to further stretch and open it. The greater compliance at the base means that during inspiration it increases in size more, allowing more air to flow into the basal alveoli during inspiration. They are smaller than the apical alveoli during the entire respiratory cycle, but have a great change in size, and overall alveolar ventilation is greater at the base than at the apex. Let's see how the intrapleural pressure affects the alveolar ventilation in a little bit more detail. At FRC, again, the intrapleural pressure in the apex is negative 10 cm water, in a base it is negative 2.5 cm water. During inspiration, in order to expand the alveoli, the intrapleural pressure should decrease by 3 units. Contraction of your diaphragm decreases the intrapleural pressure in the apex from negative 10 to negative 13, and the alveolus that has already expanded a large amount and is less compliant further expands a little and reaches this volume, this size, and little amount of air comes in. At the base, contraction of the diaphragm decreases the intrapleural pressure from negative 2.5 to negative 5.5 cm water. As a consequence, the alveolus, which was smaller when compared with apical alveolus, expands and becomes very big, reaching this size, and a large amount of air comes in. Alveolar ventilation is increased when compared with apical alveoli. It is very compliant alveolus and this is the reason why it expands very much in a little change in intrapleural pressure. I hope it makes sense to you because you see that during inspiration the apical alveolus opens a little so small amount of air reaches it whereas the alveolus in the base opens wider so more air will reach it. Let me illustrate it in a kind of graph that you may find in the physiology books. On the y-axis we have the change in lung volume, of course in mils, and on the x-axis we have the intrapleural pressure in the lung regions, uh, here is the base and here is the apex. We will see how 3 units of decreasing intrapleural pressure increases the lung volume. If we decrease the intrapleural pressure from negative 2.5 to negative 5.5 by 3 units in the base of the lung, the lung volume increases suppose this amount. In the apex, as we decrease the intrapleural pressure from negative 10 to negative 13, the lung volume increases this amount. If you compare changes in both cases, you will see that at 3 unit change in intrapleural pressure, the change in volume is more in the base than in the apex. If we draw the curve, it would look something like this. The steepest part of the curve is the base of the lung. This means that in a little change of intrapleural pressure, the large volume will reach the alveoli. However, the curve is flatter when we reach the apex. This means in 3 units change in intrapleural pressure, a small amount of air comes in. Alveolar ventilation here is less than in a basal region. This is really and really important, that's why I'm repeating it again and again. Now. There are not only regional differences in ventilation, but also there are regional differences in perfusion, blood flow through the pulmonary circuit. These differences are because of the effect of gravity and resistance. When blood flows up toward the apex, gravity opposes it. 
so pressure and floor decrease. That was the first reason. The second reason of decreased blood flow to the apex is increased vascular resistance. This occurs because in this region the alveoli have large size because of decreased intrapolar pressure and also blood vessels are compressed by the alveolar air pressure on their outsides. Therefore resistance increases and pressure and flow decrease. When blood flows down toward the base, the gravity assists the blood flow so pressure and flow both increase. Also because the vessels are more distended and alveoli here are small, they have low resistance. Thus the pressure and flow increase. To sum it up, as you move from apex to base, both ventilation and perfusion increase. However, the increase in perfusion is greater than the increase in ventilation toward the base of the lung. Both increase as you move to the base, but differ in a severity of increase. Perfusion increases significantly, whereas ventilation increases dramatically. This brings us to the ventilation perfusion ratio, which normally is 0.8. Let us talk about VQ ratio in detail because it is really important for the USMLE. The ventilation perfusion ratio measures how well pulmonary perfusion and pulmonary ventilation are matched, indicating how efficiently oxygenation of blood is occurring in a pulmonary capillaries. It is very important to know that normally the lungs receive close to the entire cardiac output, which is about 5 liters per minute, and the alveolar ventilation necessary to supply the oxygen to saturate the hemoglobin as the blood passes through the capillaries is about 4 liters per minute. A ventilation rate of 4 liters per minute and pulmonary perfusion rate of 5 liters per minute yield a VQ ratio of 0.8, which implies suboptimal matching of pulmonary ventilation and perfusion. A VQ ratio of 1 is ideal and represents optimal matching of pulmonary ventilation and perfusion, but USMLE takes 0.8 as a normal matching. Let us talk about VQ ratio in detail by drawing a lung and dividing it into three zones. It is very important to note that the lung receives 5 liters of blood per minute. Blood entering the pulmonary circulation under resting conditions has a PO2 of about 40 millimeters of mercury and a PCO2 is 46 millimeters of mercury. The blood pH is 7.4. Suppose the second zone receives close to an ideal amount of perfusion and ventilation and thus the VQ ratio is 0.8. In this zone as blood passes through, it gives CO2 to alveoli and PCO2 in the living blood will drop to 40 mm of mercury and equals alveolar PCO2. As for the PO2, it increases because the blood receives oxygen from alveoli and living blood PO2 increases up to 100 mm of mercury and also equilibrates to 100 mm of mercury alveolar PO2. The pH remains 7.4. This zone represents our ideal lung unit at rest and again PaO2, P alveolar O2 is 100 mm of mercury and P alveolar CO2 is 40 and the blood pH is 7.4. In a USMLE, the main question will be related to these values. They can ask how PO2, PCO2 and PA change in different regions of the lung and in some clinical situations which we will talk about later. Now, moving towards the apex in zone 1, the situation changes a lot. Alveolar ventilation in the apex is less relative to the base. 
suppose it is 600 ml per minute. However, perfusion is less relative to the base and I've already explained why. Suppose flow is 200 ml per minute. If you have noted relative to one another, perfusion is less than alveolar ventilation. Please note, these are not exact numbers and I'm putting them just to make it easier to understand. If we calculate VQ ratio, it would be 600 divided by 200 equals 3 and it is greater than 0.8 which is the normal value. This concludes that the alveoli are overventilated relative to the perfusion. If alveolar ventilation is excessive, then it follows that alveoli blow off more carbon dioxide. Thus, the PaCO2 decreases to less than 40. If PaCO2 decreases, the PaO2 increases and it would be more than 100. The blood leaving the lung will have the same parameters as the alveoli. As the arterial PCO2 decreases, the pH increases to more than 7.4 because I know you remember that CO2 generates hydrogen ions. The opposite is true when we move toward the base of the lung to zone 3. Here you already know that alveolar ventilation is high relative to the apex. Suppose it is 1000 ml per minute. However, perfusion is also high relative to the apex. Suppose it is 1600 ml. Again, these are not exact numbers. I put numbers just to make it easier to understand. If we calculate VQ ratio, it would be 1000 divided by 1600 ml equals 0.6 and it is less than 0.8. This concludes that the alveoli are underventilated relative to the perfusion. If alveolar ventilation is inadequate, then it follows that alveoli blow off less carbon dioxide than normal and accumulate CO2 in alveoli. Thus, the p-alveolar CO2 increases more than 40. If PCO2 increases, the PO2 decreases and it would be less than 100. The blood leaving the lung will have the same parameters as the alveoli. As the arterial PCO2 increases, the pH decreases to less than 7.4 because I know you remember that CO2 generates hydrogen ion. In contrast, in a zone 1 we had alveolar overventilation. Now let us apply this on a graph. On x-axis we have the lung region. Here is the base and here the apex. Here we have the VQ ratio and here we have the absolute perfusion or ventilation. They may give you two lines representing perfusion and ventilation that look something like this. As you see in a normal situation, this point would be ideal because ventilation and perfusion are matched. It is the ventilation perfusion ratio is 0.8. If this were the case, the alveolar PCO2 will be 40, uh, alveolar PO2 will be 100 and blood pH is 7.4. As we have mentioned already, in the base of the lung, we have the greatest perfusion, but ventilation is not enough to match with my perfusion. To match my perfusion and get the ideal PO2, PCO2, pH parameters, my ventilation line should be like this, but it is not. And as you see, we have this amount mismatch. In a base, the VQ ratio is less than 0.8. This, we say that the alveoli are underventilated. When the alveoli are underventilated, the alveolar PCO2 increases more than 40. If the PCO2 increases, the PO2 decreases less than 100. As the PCO2 increases, the pH decreases to less than 7.4. Now, as I move to the apex of the lung, we have lowest perfusion, but it is not enough to match with my ventilation, which is at this 
point. To match my ventilation and get the ideal PO2, PCO2 and pH parameters, my perfusion line should be like this, but it is not. In Apex, the VQ ratio is more than 0.8. This, we say that the alveoli are overventilated. When alveoli are overventilated, the alveolar PCO2 decreases to less than 40. If the PCO2 decreases, the PO2 increases more than 100. As the PCO2 decreases, the pH increases more than 7.4. In some USMLE books, you may find this curve representing the VQ ratio, but I think it's not a high yield for the exam. Now, for the USMLE, you have to be able to compare two or more VQ mismatches with each other and know how the PO2, PCO2 and pH parameters change when compared with each other. For example, they can give you two patients with different VQ ratio and ask. If the VQ of patient A is 0.58 and patient B is 0.42, which one has higher PO2, higher PCO2 and higher pH? In order to answer this question, you have to remember the normal VQ ratio, which is 0.8, and then we will compare which of these patients is closer to 0.8, to the normal ratio. The closer is the VQ ratio to 0.8, the higher the PO2. 0.58 is closer to 0.8 compared to 0.42 is. This, the patient A has higher PO2. As far as patient is from 0.8, as higher is PCO2. 0.42 is much far from 0.8 compared to 0.58 is. This, the second patient has higher PCO2. Higher PCO2 means lower pH because it is CO2 that generates uh, hydrogen ions. This, the first patient, which should have less PCO2 because it is closer to 0.8, has higher blood pH.